to World Wednesday and this week we are doing Eat Your Weeds. Whenever you weed your garden, you don't need to throw them away in the compost heap, just eat them. And I'm joined today by Brian, my colleague. Hello! <laughs> I'm behind the camera. Uh, I'm, I'm Kath's glamorous assistant. Um, I am filming today and um, if anybody has any questions for Kath, because she is the ultimate fountain of all knowledge, then please pop them in the comments section below and I will ask them for you. So uh, yeah, so any questions you have throughout the session today, please don't hesitate to pop them in the comments and we will happily um, ask them to Kath. So yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> it's like you're... Uh, What's it throwing your voice? <laughs> if you just joined. <laughs> anyway, sorry, back to you, Pat. Go. I, I will try and answer any questions. Try. I don't guarantee. <laughs> if not, I'll try and Google. <laughs> so, why would you bother eating weeds? I mean, the supermarket's full of food. Your garden's probably got all sorts of things growing in it. Why would you bother? Well, number one, they're free. Number two, they're surprisingly tasty. It could be a whole new range of flavours for you. They're high in vitamins, mineral, minerals and protein, more so than cultivated vegetables. For example, 100 grams of nettle, we have... Oh, you're fearless, just pick nettles, up. Um, contain 333 milligrams of vitamin C. Okay. Um, you'd only get 13 milligrams in the same amount of lettuce. Well, you could probably eat a bit more lettuce, but you know, there we go. They've also got 630 milligrams of calcium, as opposed to 212 in curly kale. So, absolutely full of nutrition, really, really good for you. Because people have been eating this sort of thing for thousands of years. They were eating it long, long before we had supermarkets and grown vegetables. Everybody in the Middle Ages looked forward to that spring flush of the new green leaves coming out because they'd spent all winter eating salt pork, if they could get meat at all, peas, you know, dried peas made into a broth, this sort of thing. One, they were really bored, and B, their stomachs were beginning to be a little tired of eating all that uh, stodge and stuff. So as soon as they got the new fresh green things coming out, they were out there foraging like fury and making a really nice salad or soup or stew out of what they could find. And it really boosts the immune system. It picked them up after the winter dullness and it sorted their bowels out, which was very important if you were medieval. It's a great way to connect with nature. In the supermarket, we can buy strawberries all the year round. We can buy asparagus all the year round. Weeds are completely seasonal. They're a great way to get out, see what's growing now, what's good to eat, what isn't good to eat, what's gone over. You know, you look forward to the next thing coming. So it's a great way to rewild yourself. Go out and have a forage. It's an adventure. The children will love it. It's like going out there with your basket or your bag, picking the little bits. It might even tempt the fussy eaters. You know, try this, try a bit of that. Very, very interesting way to do it. Gets you interested in wild plants and it encourages them to protect nature. When you come to think of it, nobody's just going to stand by and watch the hedge that they pick the sloes for their slow gin out of being bulldozed. You'd be out there protecting it. You'd be pinned to the barriers. <laughs> Especially at the moment. Absolutely. We need to drink all the gin we can. So, it, slow gin is a bit heavy for this time of year. Yeah, it is. Really. It's a Christmas drink, that, isn't Christmas it? Christmas drink. We will come to slow gin later. <laughs> it's lots of fun. It's good exercise. It gets you out. You know, it's you're out in the fresh air, you're out in nature, you're in interacting with nature. So, give it a go. There's a few basic rules. Most of them are fairly obvious. Don't pick it where it might have been polluted. So where there might have been herbicides or pesticides sprayed, council land's bad for that. By the sides of roads, where the exhaust fumes have got them and that sort of thing, and anywhere dogs have probably peed on them. 
Field gateways is really bad for that. So avoid field gateways, avoid the side of the road. Don't pick anything that's rare, even if it looks very tasty. Everything we've got here is dead common. You have to have the landowner's permission to gather stuff on their land, and particularly if you're digging up roots. Very important. I'm lucky, I've got the garden and I've got a field. So all of this stuff is either out of my garden or my field, so I didn't really have to worry about that. But do get permission. Landowners really don't care. Oh, we've got a question. Oh yeah, I have a question. Like with mushrooms, we wouldn't go and just pick mushrooms um, because we wouldn't be sure if they're poisonous. Is, is, that their da is there that danger with plants? There is. That okay. is my next rule. Sorry, okay. Jumping You're jumping the gun, Bronnie. Sorry. The next rule is identification. And this afternoon is not really a how to identify plants thing. You need a really good field guide. You need to know what you're looking at. And it's particularly the case with the umbelliferas. So the what? Think about that again? Hogweeds, cow <sighs> parsley. Um, a, lot of, a lot of them are perfectly edible. And a lot of our vegetables that we eat are related to them or descended from them. So carrots, for example, uh, parsnips, um, they all have that flat looking white sort of frothy flower, like a plate on a stick. You know the ones I mean? And they've usually got lots of hoverflies on them and that sort of thing. Yeah. So do be careful if you're gathering those that you know exactly which they are. You some could get them, them mixed up with like elderflower, couldn't you? I reckon quite easily. Some of them are really quite poisonous. All right. Um, one of the main things is if it's got a smooth stem or a spotty stem, don't touch it. If it's got ridges on the stem and slightly hairy, it's probably safe, but do make sure. Take your guidebook. It's very important, especially when you're digging the roots. Now, we'll come out of roots later, but I will just tell you the story of the hogweed. Common hogweed, not giant hogweed, which is a nasty poisonous thing. Common hogweed grows all over the place. And it's the one that has a rather purpley looking stem. It's ridged and it's bristly. I only ever pick the roots somewhere that I know hogweed grows, but none of the other carrot family, none of these other umbellifers. Because the best time to pick the roots is when the foliage has died back. So you need to know exactly what you're doing. And if you've got a bunch of sticks, more or less, coming out of the ground, it's not nearly so easy to identify it. So just a word of warning there. And there's one or two other things that can be confused, and I'll come on to those as, as we get on to them. If you do have any uh, questions, if you're watching at home, uh, please feel free to pop them in the comments section below, and I will ask Kath uh, as we go along for you. So, yeah, feel free to just pop any questions you have in the comments section below. Okay. All day yesterday, I was foraging. And of course it was a stinkingly hot day and I had a bit of a job finding anything that looked even vaguely edible. We're not in a very good time of year for picking greens. Like I said earlier, everybody would have gone out medieval times, May time, April time, when things are springing up and fresh and green. By this time of year things are getting a little bit tired. So we're a bit more restricted and some of the things have really gone a bit stringy. The reason for that is that our, our bought vegetables, if you like, our garden vegetables that are descended from some of these things were bred to be luscious and tender and easy to eat. A lot of the wild things are quite a bit stringier. So at this time of year, things are getting a bit fibrous. And I would normally, this pile here, I've, I've got the, the, the nettles, which are absolutely gorgeous. These are very young ones. Um, your garden's the best place to look because it's been cultivated regularly and you'll have new young ones growing up. And you can just pick those. These are ones out of my bean bed. And I've more or less got the whole plant and that would be perfectly okay to eat. The ones at the other end of the garden are this tall now, 
And you have to remember that you can also use nettles to make string. And this was another sort of rather medieval thing. Um, it's a horrible process. Have we, got, have we got five minutes so I can divert into making you string can, into Absolutely. I actually did want to know about string, so that's absolutely fine. What you do, I have to do this to make comparative nettle string for the museum ones. And you have to pick the biggest nettles you can find. Do wear rubber gloves. They do <laughs> sting. I know I was just holding that one, but they do sting. So I was picking these nettles that were taller than me. And I had a sort of a blade to cut them down with. And you pick them and then you tie them into a big bundle. What you want is the big stems of them. You tie them in a bundle and you put it in a flowing stream, pinned down. Then you go every day and you trample on it. You could do it in a pond, but it gets a bit mucky, you know, it's easier with the string. You trample up down on them. And after a little while, you can see that the Nettles don't really look like nettles anymore. They look like a pile of sludge, really. <laughs> and at this point, you haul the whole thing out. And here comes the really nice bit. You then have to run the nettles through your fingers like this to strip all that goop and pulp that's decayed on them off the fibres. Then you wash the fibres and hang them to dry. And you've got something like flax that you can make linen with. And it was used as a, as a, as a fabric making fibre, but very good to make a t-shirt out of. Absolutely rubbish to eat. So don't forget, stringiness is your enemy. So you've got your nice young herbs, and this is a whole selection of ones. At this time of year, I would make into a soup. So I've got nettles. I've got some rather elderly ground elder, I would prefer it to be younger than this. Um, usually I scythe down the ground elder as it grows, so I've always got some new young ones. Um, I have plantain. Oh. The, again, rather chewy, but the leaves are quite thick, they're, they're, they're quite productive. These things are common. Yeah, you see them on their like playing fields, yeah. don't you? They're dead easy to find and there's They're usually everywhere. lots of them. You want something that there's lots of. You don't want to have to spend oh. five hours on your hands and knees with magnifying glass to find your dinner. Do you want to just put that towards the camera so you can see? So that's, um, you'll find this, you know, you can go down the local park and you'll find that going everywhere. Oh, brilliant. So this, okay. is, this is greater plantain. All plantains are quite edible. In America, the Native Americans know it as white man's foot because it grows, they said, where white men had walked. It's a weed of cultivation. Okay. So you find it where the ground's been disturbed and perfectly edible. Don't eat it from the field gateway though, remember about the dogs. Um, Anna Thomas is just asking if we could have some close-up of those ones you've just Ooh. talked about. So if you give them to me, I'll put them towards the camera. Here's a so nettle. People, so a nettle, hopefully. Yeah, you can tell them. Um, whilst we're just doing that, Janet Plant, which I think is a very apt name, also asked, are young beech or birch leaves edible? So that's a Yes, nettle. beech certainly. Um, birch, I wouldn't bother about eating the leaves, but uh, you can make a very nice wine out of the sap. Ooh. And at the spring, when the leaves are just starting up, um, you can tap your birch tree, basically drill a hole in it the right size to push in one of those demijohn corks that has a hole in the middle, and then you put a tube through it and put it down into the demijohn and you can tap That's the yeah. sap. And it makes a very, very pleasant wine, very light white wine. And that's the ground elder that I'm showing everyone that's there. Fair. Ground elder Whoa. is another of the umbellifers. Do you remember the thing about the hogweed and the carrot family? And it has the same sort of white flowers, but it's a short growing thing. What else have we got? This is ladies' mantle. Oh. And the leaves, again, are quite edible. It's not truly a wild plant. Oh, hang on, I'll do this. But it's... Ladies' mantle. It's mm -hmm. one that grows quite easily in the wild as an escape. And it's the one that you see that has a little dimple of dew in the centre of the leaf. Oh, and it's furry and as it's well. Furry. It's very furry. It feels quite nice to touch. Ooh. These slightly furry things 
the furriness will disappear on cooking. I like the texture. Which is quite handy because you don't really want something furry to eat, do you? Um, so all of those are ones you can pick quite a lot of leaves off. Um, so making the soup, I would basically simmer them in some, um, a light star like vegetable stock or water and let them wilt thoroughly. I could add some dandelions. These ones I picked in a shady place, so they're quite pale green. And they're one of the ones, the dark green ones, are very, very bitter. So you want soft, pale ones. If you don't like bitterness, you can put something like a big flower pot over them for a few days until they've gone quite yellow, and that's called blanching. So those are dandelions. And this one, with the soft feathery leaf, is yarrow. Can you oh, do your yeah. business with that? Oh, is, does this go yellow? No, no, oh. yarrow the flower is always white or pinky oh, white. Normally then. The don't... bigger one with the yellow flower it's is... It's tansy. That's, That's what I was getting mixed um, up. Uh, or golden plate or something. You know, the, the, there's, there's several cultivated forms. So this is, this is yarrow. That's yarrow. yarrow. Again, very good healing herb, but you can put the leaves into your soup, but in lesser quantities. So you'd have it mainly with the nettles and the ground elder, and then these are sort of flavourings, if you like. Kel says, hello, Dr. Kel. Our, inter our internet keeps going down. Do you know what a lot of people have said about that today? That I think the heat mm. is affecting the internet. I think it, it, it will be available to... Yeah, I'm, yeah that, just know if, if you've just joined us, we are recording this um, as well and it will go up on uh, our YouTube channel. I will give details of that link as well as we go through. Also, some people asking about uh, pictures. We are providing a... We can email out a pack of all the plants featured today. With so, recipes. With recipes. Oh, brilliant. But as for... I mean, really, for pictures, me holding up a picture of this thing isn't going to help you identify uh, it. Get a good book and know what you're eating. A bit of flavouring for our soup, then. So we've got the slight bitterness of the dandelions. Everybody knows a dandelion. Every, you, know, you blow the clocks off them when you're kids, don't you? <laughs> this one's sorrel. Now, sorrel. It looks like a very tiny little leaf. It does grow a bit bigger than this. It's recognisable by the two little points on the bottom of the leaf. Oh. Oh. Do your business with that one, Sorry, right? sorry, too. Oh, if I see, see. It's the one that grows a long fl uh, flower stalk that has so reddish bits at the bottom. reddish flowers. It's also the food plant of the caterpillars of the small copper butterfly. So it goes reddish, it's a reddishy oh, colour. Yes. Ooh. So leave some for the small copper butterflies, oh. they're my absolute favourite, and that's a trailer for next week one when we're doing butterflies. Now, Bryony, eat yes. that one. What, you want me to eat this? Eat it. Eat it. Eat, eat it in front of camera. Um, Tell us what you think Oh! Oh, hang on. I've just eaten the sorrel. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, it's got a, a tang to it. It's tangy. Quite, quite lemony. Yeah. Quite oh, I wasn't expecting that. It's like, mm, a, no. like a balsamic vinegar hit. Briony is keen on going out walking in the countryside. I am. And this is fabulous. If you've run out of your bottle of water, yeah, and you're getting really thirsty, mm -hmm. and you can usually find this just about anywhere, just have one leaf and give it a chew, and you, it'll take your thirst away. Is it like an electrolyte, electrolyte type thing? Uh, personally, I think it just stimulates saliva. Oh yeah, the, well, the, it's done the, that. That's the, for sure. The tartness of it. You Ooh. can you could use it as a vegetable on its own. But they recommend you don't eat too much of this one because it, because it's acidic. It um, uses it as a flavouring really than a vegetable. Okay. I would say. Nice tangy taste though. A nice tangy taste. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Else? It was at first it was just like a normal plant, and then as I chewed it, it was like bam, <laughs> a hit. Here's another one you can get quite a lot of. Ooh, let's do this one first. Oh. This is. For some reason, hairy bittercress. Hairy it, is a, it is a cress, 
It's not hairy, really. It's Is it bitter? It's slightly hairy. It's peppery. Oh, okay. <coughs> Top. So this, these also grow in my bean bed. And they give your soup a pepperiness. It's one of the cabbage family. Cabbage and mustard and um, cultivated rocket. I brought a what this is a wild rocket, but if you I'm afraid to see the flowers are rather battered, but if you show that right. Oh you can see, oh yeah, it's like a rocket leaf, isn't it's it? It's got four petals on the flower. Oh uh, lovely. Just about everything with four petals on the flower is a member of the cabbage family. <gasps> Does that that's like a briny. Looks like a briny. Hopefully not. A white briny. It, that was rocket, honestly. Oh. No, I know, I'm not saying that. I'm it not has, it has a similarity. But that one's, again, quite a nice peppery taste. So most of the cabbage family, that sort of thing, have a, have a, a peppery bite to them. And now this one, which looks like an absolute mess, makes That's me look like a mad alchemist or something. Sticky Willy! It is indeed Sticky Willy. Goose grass. Other names are available. <laughs> you would want it very much smaller than this if you're going to put it in your soup. Again, it's quite a fibrous one. It used to be used, if you could curl it up into a basket, you can use it as a strainer because of all those oh. little hairs. Because, I mean, you see the thing sticks like fury. The little hairs can take out any impurities. And the other thing about this is these wonderful little sticky burrs on it. The little buds, yeah. The ones that you throw all over everybody's jumper. Yeah, at school. <laughs> when they're dry, you can grind them up and they make a very pleasant drink. A bit You're like joking. A bit like coffee, but without the caffeine. So you can use them. You need quite a few of them. But they are one of those things that gathering quite a few of them isn't difficult. All you need to do is walk through a field where they're growing and you'll be covered. Oh, yeah, I'll just send my dogs through and they'll yeah, sort it out. Yeah. A spaniel is the ideal thing. <laughs> so those dried up, the sticky willy balls that you get, yeah. just dried, dry them, dry. then grind them like yeah. a coffee bean yeah. and, and they make a nice make, hot drink. Like, I mean, just prepare it as you would coffee. You're joking. That's some, I did not know that. That's there we a go. great tip. So there you go. So, Sticky Willy Coffee. Those were all the different bits we could make into our soup. Um, have I done the structures? We haven't. No, we we've have. not done them. Now, not technically a wild one, but they do tend to go a bit bonkers in your garden. They seed themselves all over the place. And at the beginning of the year, you end up pulling them up and putting them in the compost. But what are we going to do, Bryony? Uh, what are we going to do now? We're going to put them in a salad. We're going to put them in a salad. Okay. The <laughs> flowers good. look really pretty in a salad. The leaves are very tasty. Have you ever tried one? I'll, I'll try one. The make, I haven't tried the leaves before. I've only tried the flowers. Let's make Ryan in a, eat in a, a posh, in a posh restaurant. Okay, ready? This is my attractive eating face. <laughs> okay. It tastes like... It tastes like nasturtium. It's peppery. It's quite It's hot. really peppery. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, that's not a picture. Yeah. No, you don't want to make a salad entirely out of them. That's a that's very peppery. No one, let's face it. But it, the other thing about it is the, the, the seeds at the end of the season Ooh. can be pickled and used like you would use capers. Okay. So, they, again, with that peppery bite. Mm, that is nice. I actually quite like that. The aftertaste is lovely. You want something a little milder in your salad. We've got some rather wilted um, daisy leaves. This was a uh, dog daisy. A dog daisy. Um, this is the tall one, but the leaves are still quite small. Garden, you know, the ones that grow in your lawn, equally good. Eat the flowers. What, the ones that you make a of daisy shade out of? Yeah, yeah, you can eat the flowers. And you can eat the leaves. Oh my gosh. And quite nice for a salad. Did the, not know that. The other good garden one for us, this is the only bit of chickweed I can find. Usually it's everywhere. It's the one that grows in great mats. So you, you pick up one bit of it and a whole heap comes out. And again, best place to look for it is in a, in a cultivated garden because it's, it, it, it's, it's quite a weedy thing. It sprawls all over the place. But it's nice and refreshing and easy to eat. When you pick it, it's best just to cut it off with a pair of scissors because otherwise the dirt gets, if you pull it up, the dirt gets in amongst all the little leaves and everything and um, doesn't taste good.
and it's a bit gritty around your teeth. So that was some salad-y things. Um, so, you would, so you wouldn't necessarily have a whole salad um, made up of these, but they're a really fantastic addition to a bit of boring iceberg. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think uh, if, you, if you had, some, you know, if you had some, some quite nice lettuce, these would give you a load of different flavours that you don't get with a with, I mean, with a with a box diamond lettuce. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but the other thing, when you're making the soup, if you don't like it all to be wild herbs, you can put a bit of um, a bit of lettuce in with that. Oh, okay. I usually thicken it with a handful of frozen peas. Do you? Okay. Um, just because it goes with the green colour, and it's actually a lot quicker than doing it with a potato. I mean, you, you've wilted your vegetables, you throw in the handful of peas, you boil it up, you blitz it. Put it in a liquidizer or one of those sticks that goes zzz, and you've got rid of all that stringiness. So that's why it's such a good thing to do with, with stuff. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry, that was the end of the recipe we started earlier. <laughs> Disorganised creature that I am. <laughs> now, this one is a... Oh, let's do this one first. This is comfrey. Oh. And... It feels unpleasantly hairy. Yeah. It has these. This one hasn't got any flowers on, but it has those like little curls. Purple one. Of pur purple, purple or pink or blue flowers. Okay. It looks a little bit like foxglove. Do watch out. Okay. Foxglove is poisonous. Comfrey. Foxgloves feel like I mean, the ear of a lop rabbit or something. Yeah. They're soft. This one, you can feel the scratchiness of it. It's a bit more tacky, isn't mm. it? Can, can, if I put oh, that yeah. there, can you hear? Scratchy. So it's a, a rough one. You wouldn't want to eat it raw. But if you take a couple of leaves off it and put them together, and then you flounce them around in some ready-made batter, like you would batter your fish with. And then you fry them. No. And sort of a tempura batter would be nice. A light, you know, quite a a light, light batter. batter. Okay. And you've got yourself a comfrey fritter. Nice. Again, very, very good for you. The medicinal use for this one is as a as a, a healer. It's a it's the one they used to know as knit bone. You can make if you pulverise the roots, you can actually make something akin to a plaster cast with them. You slap them on wherever you've broken your bone and they'll turn into a plaster cast for it. I don't recommend this. I think accident and emergency is the place for that. <laughs> but, what a cool little history fact there. But something like a sprained ankle or bad bruising, if you bruise the root or you make a paste out of the leaves and stems and put it on like a poultice, it does, it brings the bruise out and it promotes healing wonderfully. Wow. It's a really, really good one. Um, now, this other unlikely looking thing, like I say, it looks like, it looks like a weird alchemist thing. This is burdock. Oh. And burdock's the other one you stick on your friend's jumpers. Okay. It has great big leaves, which have shriveled sadly, that look a bit rhubarby. Do they get really big? They do get really big. Okay. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't find a really big one, so this is the biggest one I've got. The Reebrook has some really big yeah, ones. Yeah, they do it? grow by damp places. Yeah. Uh, this is the one that was original. They used to use it to make that dreadful dandelion burdock drink. <laughs> uh, you can still get it. You can get posh versions made by Fentimans and people. <laughs> this is not advertising. Personally, I think it's all disgusting. Um, <laughs> Or you can get the cheap version that's made by the same people who make Tizer and things. But <clears throat> uh, dandelion and burdock, yeah. The other thing that it's famous for is the roots, because it has a great big root that's much used in Japanese cooking. And really, the, the way the Japanese do it is the best way to cook it. And you slice it quite thinly, saute it, so just fry it lightly, then add some water. Not very much, just cover it and let it simmer in it until the burdock discs have gone tender and most of the water has been absorbed or what do you call it, evaporated. 
by that time, you've got rather a nice vegetable and just season it with a little soy sauce and it's very, very tasty. Appears hugely in the macrobiotic diets and things. It's very, very cleansing, very good for you. I usually avoid anything with the word cleansing in it. There you go, that was quite tasty. The other thing you can do with it is you can peel the leaf stalks. Now, this is better if you've got a bigger one than this. This one's obviously quite a, quite a little leaf stalk, but they peel quite readily and it gets rid of all that stringiness. And then once you've peeled it, you steam it lightly and you've got a nice little vegetable. This is something a bit different from the leafy things. You might get a bit tired eventually of eating a plate of well, spinachy looking things. The leaves generally everybody say cook as you would spinach. And I'm afraid they'll come out looking a bit like as it would spinach. But these make a little sort of asparagusy thing. Oh, okay. So, right. what else could we cook? A stem that would be add a bit of interest to our diet. The comfrey. Stems of this one would work just the same. Peel them and eat the innards. Thistles. Even, you know, the big, you know, the big spear thistle? The sort of Scottish thistle looking thing? Um, you can peel the stems of those and eat those. Young hogweed shoots, we're back to that hogweed. You really have to learn to identify hogweed because there's so many things you can do with them. Hogweed shoots are the one that, when the, before the flower comes out, they have that big sort of bulgy thing on the side, covered uh, in a, a sort of leafy yes, sheath you. thing. Yeah. And if you pick them at that stage and steam them, it's better than broccoli. It's better than that calabrese you buy in the supermarket. Absolutely delicious and absolutely free. I did bring a bit of hop. Oh, unfortunately it went very wilted in the car. So it's <laughs> indescribably <laughs> awful looking at the moment. But that's another one you can have to shoot. Particularly in the spring when it's growing happily. Cut the shoots off about that sort of length four or six inches long, steam them and they make a very tasty sort of little asparagusy thing. Very good with eggs. Mm. So do it with some scrambled eggs or put it in an omelette or something like that. Absolutely delicious. The hop growers used to use the hop shoots as a vegetable quite regularly because they have to prune them anyway. So they've got whole handfuls of these things and eat them rather than throw them away. Much better. They have a slightly hoppy taste, but not too strong. So that shoot flowers. That's a... This is the only flower I have today. And this is a red clover. Yeah. So very easily recognizable. And again, very nice in a salad, just on its own as a slightly sweet, might be flowery flavour. It's not red, it's more purpley pink. Mm. No. <laughs> I did promise myself I wasn't going to eat in front of the camera because it makes talking terribly difficult. <laughs> the other one that you find wild, that the flowers are good, is borage. borage yeah. And I don't know if you could, can you yeah. show that to the camera? Do, do, do. And I'll try and find one that's not too horribly wilted. I picked this yesterday and it really doesn't look very happy. Okay. These have a sort of cucumbery flavour. Mm. and famous for being put in pins so but equally nice in your in your salad my mum does a really good recipe of borage with pasta mm, yeah. she sort of adds it to the pasta dish and it tastes lovely yeah very nice and you've got a fresh taste yeah so that's a couple of nice flowers we can have a couple that you can use in flour particularly these more for flavoring a drink so maybe you could make a cordial of them or you could put them in something like a very light white wine and this is woodruff do your business with woodruff yeah. woodruff has a tiny white flower 
and as you'll see this one has the same fuzzy little seeds that the goose grass had that we were looking oh, at yeah. earlier the sticky willy wits and it's the same family oh it's got the, it feels the it's same it's got those whorls around the stem so the leaves go in little um, roughs around the stem which is why it's wood rough and it's got a lovely scent to it when it's a bit younger than this one but yes you can you can smell a sort of sweetness to it so sniffy so that one if you infuse, oh, wow, yeah. if you put it in a in a jug of white wine a light flavored white wine and you leave it for a while and then maybe do it with some iced sparkling water to make a spritzer you'd have a, a, a lovely refreshing drink the other one that's good for doing that with is meadow sweet which is the one you see quite a tall thing growing in fairly wet places and it's got that froth of white creamy white flower on it and it is a very distinctive scent um, and you it's not actually meadow sweet because it grows in a meadow it's meadow sweet because it used to be mead sweet oh. and it was added to mead the wine made out of honey to flavor it also as a strewing herb because you get that lovely scent of mown hay from it so that's another one cut the flowers make sure there's no bugs in them give them a good shake pop them in a jug of wine or something very tasty how are we doing for time you're fine we're fine right what else are we moving across the table now <laughs> What are you going to do for carbohydrates? Ooh. So we've got all sorts of things as are leafy greens. Remember? Roughage. There it's only sometimes a year. We've got all the minerals and everything, the, the, the vitamins, but we want some starch. We want a bit of starch to go with it. Unfortunately, we're quite ill supplied with starchy sorts of things in this country until they brought in the potato people mainly ate bread but there are quite a few things you can eat now an inspiring looking creature isn't it this is the root of lords and ladies oh. this is the in spring they call it cuckoo pint it's the one with the hood with the brown spike pale green hood with a brown spike up it this time of year it's just a stalk with the red berries on and all the top bits of it are hideously poisonous so don't eat them the root however if i ate it like this would be fairly hideously poisonous but if it's well baked it's starchy quite a sweet flavor and good carbohydrate so that's a possibility <laughs> Maybe do that one if you're more confident forager. I would, some of these things have a touch of famine food looking about them. <laughs> um, now, this disgusting looking thing is silverweed. And that's the one that has the leaf that is silvery on the bottom and sort of downy green on the top and has a yellow flower, very low growing. The roots of it, do I'm your sure business? It, yeah. The roots of it are pretty small, but as you can see, they're quite swollen. Here's a, here's a slightly better root. It hasn't got much of a plant to it, oh. but uh, as you can see, it's got quite little sort of tubery things. Oh, yeah. And it actually makes a very good starch. So they used to be cultivated in the Hebrides as a foodstuff. You know, people used to grow them specially to eat. You'd hardly wonder at the size of that. But if you get a fairly elderly plant a little later in the year than this, they've really built their roots up, and that was quite edible as well. The previous one, the, the, the Lords and Ladies root, used to be harvested and processed and called Portland Sago in the way of giving things names like that so people will think they're really quite edible rather than calling it lord and lady's root whereupon people will go no don't fancy that very much <laughs> but it used, to, it used to be sold as as a as an alternative to arrow roots and things you can right. make a, a pudding out of it for invalids 
or you could just eat it mainly because you haven't got anything else to eat but good start you think on to the hogweeds again i'm afraid <laughs> do you no. love them hogweeds no i hate them oh okay the hogweed was one of yesterday's disasters there i was in the field digging up a hogweed because i wanted to show you a hogweed root they make quite a bulky root normally i dig them slightly later in the year they're a bit like a slightly gone berserk parsnip if you like kind of a bit longer and thinner and i thought i will dig up hogweed and i'll take it in and they'll all be so impressed by it it's a great thing you can again um, use it like you would the burdock you can use it as a thickener you can mash it up you can best way to do it though is to grate it scrub it well and grate it and then boil the gratings and you'll end up and drain it off you end up end up with something very like sweet potato they're very tasty so there i was with my big fork in the field having a good good dig at it and i went all round it and i dug like mad and did a bit of levering and it wouldn't come and i did a bit more levering and it wouldn't come and then i did a bit more levering and the fork came out and shot me backwards into the biggest patch of nettles you've ever seen <laughs> oh no so i ended up yesterday completely covered in nettle rash which wasn't very nice so i haven't brought one it stays as it is in the garden because it's so dry at the moment it's terribly difficult to dig anything up which is probably why the uh, poor old silver weed roots are so meager looking if it had been a bit damper i might have been able to find a bigger one easier at this time of year would be the root of the reed mace called cattail in America. You might know them as bulrush, but there is no mistaking it. That's the one with the big fuzzy brown top on it. Rather flat leaves that grow like a grass would rather than growing flat out like that. Now do be careful about this one. Make sure it really is reed mace because the quite similar yellow irises which grow in similar places, but the leaves don't grow like a grass does. Um, the herbals describe as powerfully cathartic. <laughs> yeah, um, you don't really want to eat them. Just about every part of reed mace is edible. This is the most fantastic plant for all sorts of reasons. The roots, fabulously starchy. You can, um, process them in several ways. I mean, if you scrub them and grate them and steep them in water, the starch will release and you can use it almost like a flour. You can, you can bake them and peel off the fibrous outsides. They are very fibrous. You don't want to eat that bit. It's, um, it's very unfortunate effects on the digestion. Gives you a bit of a stomach ache, shall we say. Um, but very edible and the shoots that are growing off the root for a new one of these to grow up, which look like a little tooth with a slight hook on the end, are very tasty. And if you're canoeing along or walking along by the river and you pull one of these so it slides out of its outer leaves, which they will do quite readily when they're fresh and growing, you make some funny noises. And you'll find at the bottom of it, it's got rather a nice pale green bit which you can have a good nibble on it's a bit like eating bits of grass as you go through the field is it quite sweet <laughs> it's like a baby isn't it? da, 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 da. it's not exactly the most um, user not, friendly snack is it it's not very user friendly <laughs> if, if you cut it with a knife which i haven't got the you can sort of have a chew at it and get the inside out and it's quite nice and refreshing before the brown bits is formed, you get the sort of start off bit, if you like, which looks a bit like that, but it's covered in yellow, yellow pollen. And you can collect that and use it as a flower. Mix it with some ordinary flour and make pancakes or biscuits with it. Wow. So, very, very useful thing, uh, a, a, a reed mace. I always think they look like, you know, the Americans have corn dogs. Yes. They look like a corn dog. Yes, they do. They do look <laughs> Um, very, very, very useful thing to have around though. And one of the ones that's really completely unmistakable. Yeah. As long as you've got 
some that have got, and the remains of the brown seed spike will stay on it through the winter. And as long as you've got that, you know exactly what you're dealing with. The other thing, of course, is once it's gone into fluff, once it's burst and the seeds coming out, they make fabulous kindling for starting your fire yeah. to cook your um, reed mace roots on. So you could have your, your entire meal out of one plant. So you could like cook it and mash it up or anything like that as a fibrous plant. It would have to um, be the roots. Yes, you could. You, once you once you've got to the middle of the the roots, you right. could scrape scrape the softer non fibrous bit right. out of the middle right. and mash it up. Maybe a little, a little butter and pepper or something, and uh, use it as a like you would a sweet potato or something. Okay. So the other thing I found while I was scrambling, as while I was, while I was while I was getting out of the nettle patch, <laughs> was this. Um, this. This particular one is Good King Henry, because it has several relatives and they're called, generically, they're called Goosefoot, because they've got that leaf that looks like a, a little like foot. a goose's foot. And there's one called Fat Hen. This one's Good King Henry, and they have Fabulously useful leaves. Again, they feel a bit mealy. They feel, if you rub them like that, you can feel the sort of dustiness. But once they're cooked, that's completely gone. They're another one in the family with the nettles and the ground elder. Be good for soup. Make a very good vegetable. Cook it like you would spinach. The best bit of it, though, is if you get these lovely little flower spikes when they're just still in bud, just starting like this, you can cut them off about there, so you've taken all the leaves off. Melt a little butter in a frying pan, a small frying pan, and just drop them in very briefly. You get a lovely nuttiness to them. They come out, they go brown quite quickly, get them quite pale brown, you don't want them any any darker. And then you've just got a nice little nibble. And they, they've got that splendid, um, it's a sort of nuttiness. So, very useful thing, and I was so glad that I fell in the nettles, which made I could find that. There is good in everything, even falling in the nettles. So, that is all of our... Um... The only other thing I haven't mentioned is wild garlic. Wild garlic is available as a leaf much earlier on in the year. If you find a wild garlic leaf at this time of year, it's not a wild garlic leaf. And the chances are, it's lily of the valley. It's hideously poisonous. So, don't pick it. If it doesn't smell like garlic, it's not wild garlic. This stuff grows in, not this stuff, the wild garlic, grows in huge quantities. One of my best foragings ever for wild garlic was in the old churchyard in um, Betacaid and it's absolutely carpeted in it. And as long as you don't mind eating things you found in a graveyard, it's absolutely fine. But you can find it in, in swathes, so it's a very good one to pick. You can make it into a lovely risotto. You put strips of it in your salad. It, it is quite garlicky, but... Um, I've had it in stir fries. Stir fries, mm -hmm. anything like that. The you, can, you can use the, uh, the, the flowers before they've opened completely. Um, at this time of year, we are reduced to this. This is the root bulb of the wild garlic. Bryony, come and have a sniff. Ooh. Tell me what that smells like. It smells like an onion. Onion with a, a very definite hint of garlic. Oh yeah. It's, it's, it, is, it is garlicky. It, it, it's quite intensely garlicky, so you don't need very much. Of course, it doesn't mean you have to dig up a bit of your wild garlic patch. I actually planted some in a damp, dark, sort of overshaded corner of the garden, and it goes completely bonkers if you're not careful. But not terribly fast, so I'm quite happy because I use a lot of it. Craig Baker of the, the Wildlife Trust variety, I presume. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he makes a lovely wild garlic pesto in spring. That's a brilliant idea. Very fancy. That's a very, very nice thing to do with it. 
anything like that that you could you could preserve and you could maybe even freeze you make a, a, a pasta sauce with it that you could freeze would be a good way to keep it through the year oh and janet plant made some wild garlic butter to go on homemade mm. baguette this year oh that's, that's a that great be, idea that would be lovely you could use the roots for that as well yeah but you don't need nearly as much of it okay the other really nice way to keep it to use at this time of year is to pickle the flower buds now these ones i actually found in the new deli section of the boat house in ellesmere so i didn't make any myself this year but these are absolutely yummy so pickled these are the pickled these flowers these are the flower buds <gasps> so Wow, I don't know. I'm now, not you have to, to eat one of those. I'm just going to try and show people without tipping <laughs> it everywhere. So these are, oh, they smell them. Oh, who's that? Can I have one? Yeah. We'll put one, on, put one on there and then we'll be able to. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. You can demonstrate it. So these then. are the, the buds of the um, wild of wild garlic. So the normally other, bright white. The other name for it is, is ramsons. In, ramsons. in your flower book, it could probably be ramsons. Okay. Oh, my God. They are really, really yummy. That is, that is amazing. And it keeps it going all year. Oh my god! You can, all you need to do mm. is, oh, I could, that's like, cider I'm, vinegar oh. and sugar. Um, hang on a moment, I'll tell you the exact. <laughs> just, just in case, I know you can't make it at this time of year, but here we are. Cider vinegar and a three vinegar. parts of cider vinegar to one part sugar. So, if you've got Three cups of cider vinegar, put in one cup of sugar, depends how much you want. That's then really good. You've got these really yummy little pickles. Basically, warm up your cider vinegar with the sugar in it until it's the sugar is melted. Just granulated sugar will do. Let it cool down again. Put your flower buds with no green bits on them in a, in a jar. And then mm -mm. fill it with the cider vinegar and sugar mixture and just let it stand. You can eat them fairly, pretty well straight away. Give it a couple of days, they go really nice. You That'd can... be really nice on like a, a steak sandwich. Mm. That's lovely. Make, it goes very well with potatoes. Yeah. Uh, um, you could put, maybe put some in, in a mashed potatoes or if you fried potatoes, just add a few at the end. Oh. Very nice in a stir fry. That's my new favourite thing, um, that is. Love it. And the, the pickling juice makes an absolutely lovely salad dressing if you add a little oil to it. You don't, once you've eaten all the flower heads, you've got something left that you can make really nice garlicky, sorry, salad dressing. <laughs> oh, I'm definitely doing that next Those year. are so yummy. So yes, ways to preserve your wild garlic. You can eat the roots or you can pickle bits of it. But don't mistake it for the, um, Lily of the Valley, please. No. If it's there at this time of year, it's Lily of the Valley. No, no. Yeah. So, we're heading now into the autumn. And what is autumn famous for? Harvest. Harvest. Fruit. Harvest so, Festival. The most obvious one is blackberries. Um, mine have been doing really well yeah. already. This particular load of blackberries I had to go to the non-sunny side of the bush because I picked all the ones off the other, but they're really, they look great. really nice, tasty blackberries. Everybody can recognise blackberries, they're not a problem. Mm. Well, that's... Obviously, you can eat them as they are. Yeah. You can make really nice jams and jellies. Crumble. Crumble, all that sort of thing with them. Um, if you're making jams and jellies, sometimes it helps to put in a bit of apple because that has the pectin to help it set properly. I usually make jellies out of them because my husband really doesn't like the seedy bits in them. And just a hint, for those of you, there might be one or two, who have never picked a blackberry before, see if I can find one, um, don't, you don't need to pull them off the bush, you just tweak them a bit sideways. If they're ready, they'll come off. And unlike a raspberry, they don't leave the inside of the fruit behind. No. So you'll see a little white spot. If it hasn't got a white spot in it, it looks a bit old, it's got any maggots, obviously you don't eat it. There's usually, if you've got one, you've got thousands. Yeah. And you can be quite picky about it. So those will be ready 
Now, queen of all fruits, this is a Hi. wild strawberry. <laughs> they're seems very, slightly pointless. But they're very yeah. small, but they're extremely tasty. And the leaves Touch. make quite a nice tea. Oh. So you can make strawberry leaf tea. A lot of people think that they're like shriveled up normal strawberry. Oh, come on. They are come pretty on. minuscule. Yeah. They're really, they pack a punch. Oh, that's but they rubbish. do have the most fabulous flavour. Yeah. And most of these things, if I mean, when I'm picking blackberries, I pick what's there today and then I'll be out tomorrow picking again because so right in it. You, you, you can freeze them and then when you've amassed it up, you can make a nice uh, what's the jam or pickle. These are not ready yet and these are slows. So these are going to be absolutely fabulous in a couple of months time, sort of October, November. They say you shouldn't pick them until they've been frozen, until there's been a frost on them. Um, personally, once they've gone black, but they've still got that slight purple bloom on them, I pick them and put them in the freezer. And that makes them think they've been frosted and it takes away a little bit of the bitterness. You can't eat them as they are. If you put one of those in your mouth, you'll end up um, with it all drawn together like you've been sucking lemons. They're really, really, really wesh. Hazelnuts can be eaten green, or if you're lucky enough to find them that a squirrel hasn't eaten, can be eaten ripe. Um, some more unusual things like um, hawthorn. Mm, yeah. The fruits again make a rather nice smoky flavoured jelly. At this time of year, normally, I'd be getting ready to do an autumn foraging thing and we'd have all these berries and things that uh, with pickles and jellies and jams made out of them that you could try, but it doesn't really work online, does it? Um, rose hips coming up and elderberries, again, fairly obvious. All of these things um, you can make into a wonderful stockpile for your winter larder. The autumn... I, I do usually, when I'm doing spring foraging and autumn foraging, I have two very nice handouts. So this is the Eat Your Weed Spring Foraging and this is the Autumn Foraging. And they do have recipes and lots of tips about about what to do. If you email me, and the email address hang is... On, hang on, I'll put it on the comment section. Ready, go. Kath P. Yeah. At Shropshire Wildlife Trust dot org dot uk. Gosh, we need shorter email address. <laughs> Wildlife Trust dot org dot... Orf, I put orf. <laughs> dot orf dot org. Dot org dot uk. Done. So if anybody would like a PDF of either of those handouts, if they email me, I will send them to send one to them. Wendy Goff says blackberry vinegar is terrific mm -hmm. version of balsamic vinegar. That does sound amazing. That sounds oh, really, so really much nice. that I didn't realise. That's incredible. The other nice thing is one of the things the um, Swedes are particularly keen on is they make vodkas out of all sorts of things. Yeah. So instead of just making slow gin which you, you, we're going to make with the, uh, the slaves later on in the year. Um, you could use blackberries or um, small damsons or something like that. Um, basically, you just put a quarter fill a bottle with, um, with your fruit, cover it with sugar, and add gin or vodka 